baseline of how we look at technology in classrooms using the ISTE standards, um, talking about digital citizenship, and then Jack's going to go over the GoGuardian tool that our teachers and parents have access to. So just starting with the ISTE standards, this is typically what um, schools look at when they're looking at technology or library plans um, and guides us around how students would be using technology in the classroom. And so I'm just going to kind of start at the top with empowered learners and work my way around. Um, but th this is, again, it kind of speaks to how technology has changed over the years where we're not just looking at um, keyboarding skills, but much more than that when we talk about um, helping students be prepared to eventually leave our high school and uh, be citizens independently and responsibly using technology. So it starts with empowered learners. Um, this to me speaks about differentiation. So one of the things technology brings to us is that it does allow us to meet different learner needs, whether it's students with special needs or enrichment opportunities. Sometimes you'll hear about this as personalized learning, but helping kids to understand how to use the tools to meet um, their learning goals. And then digital citizenship is probably something that people are somewhat familiar with. It's um, talking about responsibilities and opportunities that students have when they're using technology. When we talk about the constructor, it's research. So as adults, we also know that there's more information than we, than we can ever get through. And so teaching kids how to evaluate resources, find credible sources is really important. Um, with the innovate piece of it, we're looking at students to um, think about, I, I think of like the curricular connections to this. So you may have heard of like design thinking. This was a big thing in our district several years ago where we talked about going through a design process of building empathy, finding problems in the world, designing prototypes, testing those. We can use technology to do a lot of that um, and a lot of those real world applications. Um, as a former math teacher, when I see computational thinker, I think of like being able to digest large data sets and um, looking at data and making conclusions, making graphs, making tables, making sense of numbers. Um, communicators. So. How does technology, um, how can we leverage it not only for us to work within the classroom or outside the classroom when kids go home, there's collaborative tools that they can use to collaborate with classmates, but then also from a worldview around, around the world, and this goes into the global collaborator bucket here of how can we bring things in from the real world and um, from places outside our Shorewood community into the classroom and, and we can leverage um, technology for that. So that's kind of like the best of technology when we talk about integrating it. Um, the other model that you'll hear of a lot in education is the SAMR model, and this has been around for probably 10 years. And so this just talks about different ways that we can use technology. And so SAMR um, stands for substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. And those, those first two categories, su um, substitution and augmentation, or just kind of like a replacement where technology would be used to replace something that we've used before. So the example here is a substitution is instead of writing on our notebooks, we might use like a word processing document just to, for students to write out a report. This would be, um, this is not like what we aspire to when we use technology. We don't want it to replace something that could be done without technology. Um, augmentation, to me, I think of efficiency. It's using technology to do something quicker. So all right, I think of AI a lot with this. If we give a kid a math problem, they very well could just take a picture of that. And there is programs that could solve the problem for them and do it step by step. Kind of takes takes the whole learning process out of it. So again, not, not what we're shooting for. What we're looking for is more around um, modification and redefinition. So the examples here are instead of just writing an essay, um, students would be able to, with technology, do different representations of being able to understand a topic. So they could make a video, they could make a presentation. Um, again, they could get those experts from outside um, into the classroom. And redefinition is when we're able to do new tasks that we wouldn't have been able to do before. And I got to get this out of the way to be able to show the example. Um, but having students participate in a virtual field trip, exploring the Amazon rain, rainforest with a 360 degree video, 
Um, I think of like our French classroom at the middle school, they had a pen pal program with students from Martinique and they were able to actually stream the classroom in. So they were not only sending each other like notes where they were able to practice writing in um, languages, but then also actually interview them and just do that within you know, a, a normal school day. Obviously that's not something we could do without technology. And so these are just some examples of some apps um, that are used. Uh, there is a resource page at this end of end of the presentation, and we had surveyed um, teachers just to ask them what apps are they using in their classroom. So you'll be able to see that broken down by the grade levels. Many of you know we have a one-to-one -one program that starts in fourth grade. So technology use in like kindergarten through third grade is very different than technology use at say ninth through 12th grade. So you'll see different programs that are used there. Um, this graphic just kind of shows how, how they could fit into that SAMRA model. And then finally, a little bit about digital citizenship. And so there's an old view and a new view of digital citizenship. And again, when I first got into education, it was kind of that old view of digital citizenship, where when we talked about digital citizenship, it was more about like, what can we control um, within the students. So we could control which websites they were going to. We could have a zero tolerance policy for any inappropriate use of technology. It was very controlled because there were very limited uses of technology. Students weren't walking around with computers in their hands. Um, the new view of acceptable use is, again, teaching kids how to navigate a digital world. So when you see acceptable use policies, that's kind of the guideline for technology use in a district. Um, a new view of digital citizenship is that we're talking about how to appropriate how to appropriately use technology, so how we would expect students to use it, and then um, what some negative uh, implications of using technology would be. Again, we talked about um, the kind of the expectation with teaching and learning that we're able to bring in real world issues with our technology. We have classroom blogs, so we're no longer saying you will never get on the internet and share any of your information, but um, we do expect that there are classroom projects where not necessarily with student identified information, like we're not going to put students first and last names and their addresses and everything, but if they create a project to share it out with the world. Um, again, my, my middle school experience is uh, the world of 7 billion, I think it's 8 billion now because of population just keeps going up, but um, Kids would explore a global issue and they'd make a uh, one minute video, oftentimes stop animation of just how to address um, the world problem. And they could submit those to a contest. It was a really um, motivating project for them. Um, and then how do we deal with misconduct? It's on a case by case basis and thinking about restorative um, justice and social emotional learning. So helping kids again, figure out how to navigate a digital world and not just saying you will not touch technology or use technology. And so when we talk about digital citizenship, there's just kind of some different areas again that we talk about. We talk about the digital self again, how do we protect protect our digital identity and our digital footprint. So I have a third grader and a kindergartner at home. So we talk about why my third grader cannot start a YouTube channel or subscribe to other channels. And, and I have some really good real world experience of middle schoolers regretting things that they have posted on YouTube um, in elementary school that other kids find and then might you know, post to social media. So we talk about the digital footprint what's appropriate, what would I expect and what's inappropriate, what do you have to ask permission for. We talk about digital interact interactors. So again, we expect that there are times when we want students to interact with resources that are out there to um, engage in research. Um, and then we also talk about digital agents. We want, we talk about in Shorewood all the time, um, how our students um, our advocates. And so not just with their voice, but as they grow up in a digital world, they're going to have to figure out how to leverage um, these digital resources so that their voice can be heard and so that they can advocate for the rights of others. So again, just some basis there of what we think about when we talk about technology in Shorewood. I am going to pass this on to Jack now to talk about specifically 
the Go Guardian tool, which is new this year, and we got lots of questions about that. So this is going to talk about more how we can manage the technology in the classroom um, when we're you using it and communicate our expectations to students and families. Okay, I can kind of go through this slide as you're setting that up. So um, there are some policies just to go over. Um, sometimes families will have questions about that. So again, usually where this starts in most districts is looking at the acceptable use policy. So this will define um, how we expect students to use technology. And then it, it does set up some of those restrictions for what uh, inappropriate technology use would look like. Um, more specifically with our students that are in a one-to-one -one environment, we do have a Chromebook handbook that they sign off on. It goes through some more rules and guidelines specific to um, our one-to-one -one environment. Uh, within our code of conduct, we have categories related to technology, including um, intellectual dishonesty and cyberbullying. And then more specific to the schools, just um, from elementary to high school, I know there at times are cell phone questions. And so those those look different, again, as we think about um, our kids maturing and going through our system that we do want them to develop those responsible habits by the time that they leave high school. So those will look different between schools, but um, every school does have a cell phone policy that can be found on the school website. And then if it's more classroom specific, it would be in the course syllabus or course information sheets. this a little bit. Okay, so um, we wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about GoGuardian. Um, obviously, this is something I, most people are familiar with and aware that we're using now. Um, I kind of look at it as it was a critical piece of that one-to-one -one setup that we started about a year and a half ago. Um, I don't think we would be able to proceed without it. Um, and it, it breaks down into a couple different sections, and we'll go into a little bit more depth on, on two of them, which is teacher and parent. Um, so uh, to start, we have GoGuardian admin, and the idea behind that is, is that's like a, a school or district level filtering. So that's going to follow a student. It doesn't matter where they are, if they're at home, if they're at school, if they're on a hotspot, if they're at a coffee shop, right? Um, and that fulfills a number of things. Obviously, common sense, we have to, you know, put some filtering in place. But also, like we have some federal, you know, compliance uh, due to the way we get money for certain programs here um, that require. So, as I like to say, it's both, uh, you know, legal compliance, but also just common sense that we have to have, uh, you know, a basis level of filtering for all of the things that you can imagine that are not appropriate for somebody to be doing on a school district device. So um, that's that portion that also allows um, some of our district staff uh, like myself and our school administrators to do a little bit more in depth look at what a student's been doing. So if there's a concern that's been raised about something, they can review a student's history and their browsing history and stuff like that. Um, and, and generally speaking, it just gives us a little bit more data on, on what a student's doing outside of class and outside of like what a parent or teacher would be able to see. Um, mostly because if we gave that level of access to like, for example, to a teacher, it's just cumbersome to sort through all that data. So that's the primary tool that we use. Um, and then we have uh, what falls into the teaching and learning and classroom management portion would be what is called Go Guardian Teacher, which we'll demonstrate in just a second. Um, and that's going to be that more classroom specific filtering. So one of the things we focused on when we implemented this, as I, I said to teachers, I want it to be as turnkey as possible. I don't want you to feel like you have to go in. So it's an automated rostering process. When they go into GoGuardian, they log in and their classroom's there. If somebody enrolled, you know, we're in a new semester here at the high school, classes are changing, uh, rosters are changing. Um, it's automatic that uh, a student enrolls in a class today and by tomorrow morning, they're going to show up in their roster, right? So the whole idea is it's very turnkey and just fulfills itself in the background for uh, our teachers so that they're not having to worry about the small logistical items there. 
Um, and, and that is where they're able to get into more specific filtering when a student is in their classroom. So it gives them the ability to say, we're doing something in class today, and I only want you to go to these five resources, for example. And then finally, we have GoGuardian Parent. Uh, just out of interest, I have a couple parents here. Does anybody use GoGuardian Parent right now? Okay, so you're familiar a little bit with that. So GoGuardian Parent is kind of a, I wouldn't necessarily say a watered down, but just kind of a simplified version of what you would get almost in GoGuardian Teacher, right? Um, again, it would be cumbersome to give the full feature set. Um, but what it allows you to do is, is some reporting. So you can pull up, uh, it's an iOS or Android based app. You can pull up and pull up reports on what a student's been doing in detail. It provides some nice charts um, that you can look at like uh, the last seven days, 30 days, for example, of what your student's been doing. Um, and then it also allows you to do things like pause the internet on the student's device, or um, for example, like filter a specific site or a specific group of sites. So um, those are the three portions. And now I'm going to go ahead and jump out here. And if you have a Chromebook in front of you and it's still awake, um, if it's not, you can enter a temporary password. It's demo, D-E-M-O, 1701. And I'm going to go ahead and boot up in the background here. Let's see. So go to presentation classroom and we'll go ahead and start a session up. So you can see here, let me get this framed out so it's a little bit easier to see for everybody. Move this out of the way. Okay. So um, this is what, now I give the you know, disclaimer, this is a pretty watered down, simplified version because you've only got five students, right? Um, so, you know, imagine you've got 25 or 20 or something like that. But this is what it's going to look like from a teacher perspective. So uh, a couple things, it's not exactly a live view per se. Um, it refreshes about every five seconds. So if you've got something up right now and you change it and you look at the little thumbnail that corresponds with your uh, screen, if you can kind of see it, um, it's going to refresh about every five, three to five seconds to show what, what a student's doing. Um, now, as a teacher, if you were interested in, let's say, what this demo student account here is number 14, you can click on it and expand. It's going to show you um, what their screen has. So a, a couple different things in all these options are available both on an individual level or for your entire class. Um, that you're going to have the ability to do would be things like control screens, lock screens, and open tabs. So let's go through a couple examples of that. So let's say in this case, I, I don't know what the student's doing. They're off task. And just to remind them, I can just hit lock. Um, I can even add a message like, please pay attention. And I would type that here and, and just lock the screen. Um, and it's going to go ahead and lock that device. And whoever's got that device in front of them right now, you should have a blue logo screen that says no. Oh, somebody's. Okay, because I just did it for one. Now, if we wanted to do it for all of them, um, we can certainly do that. We can go lock, unlock. Um, I can select all. So again, if you just wanted to grab the entire classroom's worth of devices and lock them, it's going to go ahead and lock them, right? Um, and then we can unlock them all and, and reverse by doing that up here. Um, so it gives you the ability to do lock, unlock, um, another thing that we have shown a lot in demonstrations that I think is a really handy tool um, is the open tab function. So um, especially in the younger classes, something that I know because I've had the opportunity to sit in on a lot of classes is we lose a lot of time getting students to the right resource, right? And even at the older grades, sometimes I've noticed that too, you know, uh, it's a 15 minute activity, but we spend the first five minutes getting everybody to the right place. Um, so the ability to have everybody open their screen, lock their screen, and then when you unlock their screen, take them straight to whatever you want to take them to. So let's say I want to open a tab for all of my students. I hit next. Um, I can type something in there. I always have, I think like, uh, is my form 1040 in here? Oh no, I always put the IRS form 1040 in. That's but um, we could open up like uh, a school district website like shortschools.org. It's gonna pop that up on everybody's screen right now, um, and, and again, just gives you the ability to move your classroom to whatever resource you want, push it right to the front, um, and, and just cut down on a little bit of that logistical time of of battling to get everybody the right place. Um, additionally, then we start to talk about some of the more like uh, advanced or not necessarily advanced, but the more specific free features, you can be a little bit more granular with what uh, you want to do. So that would be what they call scenes and scenes is kind of a weird word. It's a go guardian term, but it's kind of like a filtering list, for example. Um, so 
uh, when we do this, and I won't go into the details of how you create a scene, because that would really be something that's only beneficial when we talk through with teachers, but um, I can show you, essentially, you can create two different types of scenes. You can create a list of websites that you're allowing and a list of websites that you're blocking. Now, when you do an allowed websites list, it's going to block everything else aside from what's on your allowed list. So a good example of where we see teachers doing that, there's a teacher right here in the admin building who I know does this because they were talking to me about it the other day. Um, if they want to give a quiz and they don't want students to be reaching out to other resources other than what they want, maybe there's two or three open book type resources, um, they can do a, you know, a, a scene like I have here that has a list of, of allowed resources. So for example, I created this in a, a demonstration for some teachers. Um, you can see I have an elementary library page, Google sign-in page, and all of these different things. Um, it, another interesting thing about this is that uh, GoGuardian as a tool is pretty clever. So if you enter a website in um, and it knows that there's multiple websites that it redirects you to when you're trying to use it, it'll actually recommend that you add them. So um, it, as a tool, it's actually pretty, pretty good at being aware of how you build these out. Um, and so it just allows somebody to quickly create something. And so what our teachers are then able to do is, is create these uh, allowed lists and block lists. The other nice thing that you can do when you're creating um, a, a scene like this is you can create a tab limit. And tab limits are another thing we were just talking about in a demonstration the other day. Um, and, and one of the reasons that we recommend tab limits is, is because um, that's something that we see a lot with that concern about a, a lot of different things in front of a student. They're not able to stay on task because they have so many different resources in front of them. If a teacher, for example, knows that there's no reason that a student should have more than, say, five tabs, they can add it to a scene. Or even when we were talking with a few teachers yesterday, I said, you can just create a scene that's just a tab limitation scene. And, and you can apply multiple scenes in a class. So um, you can apply a specific scene to a specific student too. So like we'll have a situation where a, a teacher knows of a student who has a, a concern that they have with being off task and having too many tabs open. And they'll just say, okay, for this one student, you only get five tabs during class. Um, because typically that's where we start to see the problem. It's like that, you know, 10, 15, 20 tabs, you know, all across the top. Um, Another thing that's helpful um, in the scene function that we really encourage people to use um, from the teacher side is, is the sharing function. So the nice thing is, is like, for example, I created this and started sharing it with some of our teachers, and it's just a list of commonly distracting websites. So they're not websites that by default we block, um, but they're websites that we know, for example, that more often than not, they're going to be creating a classroom distraction. And if there's not a educational reason that they need to have them in class, um, I shared this op, uh, the scene out with our staff, then they're able to just click and add it straight to their, their GoGuardian account. So it gives them the ability to not even have to create the scene themselves. They just added this. Um, you can see chess.com is in there. That was actually a, a big debate between the students and staff here. And I think we conceded. I believe one of our student reps was actually uh, quite outspoken about chess.com being unblocked um, last year. So um, so those are a couple of the tools that we you know, really recommend. Um, the other nice thing, though, too, is that actively, again, you can view a student screen, you can apply filters and, and lock screens and open tabs and limit tabs, but it also gives you the ability to look at what we call a, a timeline in here. So um, again, it's not a lot of activity. If you guys were clicking around on here, you would see, um, and I know we had a couple of teachers yesterday who were pretending to be students who were kind of simulating it, but this allows a, a teacher to open up a, essentially a timeline of what their students are doing in class. And um, one of the nice things that we were talking about yesterday is if you have a student who's really struggling with staying on task and they're moving back and forth between resources a lot, you can kind of see it on that number 14, how it's like choppy like that versus um, like nice long blocks of time. So uh, again, it's kind of at their discretion if they're looking at something and they know a student shouldn't be switching between four or five or 10 different tabs constantly, it's going to be able to uh, pick that out. Now, if they're noticing something like that, they can go back to a student. So let's go back to our screens tab for a second. And I don't know who this is, but um, so let's just say that this demo student 11, we have a concern like, I don't know, this isn't distracting, but let's just say google.com is distracting. They can just hit close. It's just going to knock that tab off the student screen so they no longer have it. So um, it gives teachers the ability to just go and grab a tab and, and pop it off their screen. 
Um, and then at the same time too, you have the ability to go back and retroactively look at a report. So this is the nice thing from a teacher's perspective that they can roll back and look at a classroom. So let's look at, um, actually this would be a good example um, yesterday. So let's do demo classroom and let's run a report for, hmm, actually we'll do presentation classroom today, student 11 view report. So it's gonna give them the ability to view report looking at the website history on that device. Um, and then the other nice thing is that they can actually generate an email and PDF of that report and then just send it right off to a parent or a guardian or an administrator if they have a concern. Um, so that function gives them the ability to kind of similar, similarly report what you would get in GoGuardian Parent. Um, they're going to be seeing a similar report, keeping in mind that it's only within the confines of their class. So right, like they're not going to see what a student was doing at lunch or what a student was doing, you know, uh, before or after school. It's just limited to their their classroom window. So those are the core um, pieces of GoGuardian Teacher. Before we move over to Parent, I think we're doing all right on time, Mike. Yeah, okay. Do we want to stop? Any questions about GoGuardian Teacher? Anything that you would like to see demonstrated again? Any Anything like that? Sure. So... Um, those features that you showed look great. Are were those being used last semester, or were those not in use last semester? So, uh, what I can say is that we're seeing pretty consistent uptick. So, looking at how much Go Guardian was used last year, I think for year one we were pretty satisfied with the level of util utilization. I think we're looking to get more this year. Obviously, um, that was one of the things that we're trying to provide more training opportunities. I'm trying to get into classrooms more. I've got a couple of people in my department who are trying to get into classrooms more and encourage the utilization. Um, I can say like last year, for example, we saw, I think we logged approximately 10,000 classroom sessions, um, which you, if you average it out over our teaching population showed a, a pretty significant majority of our five through 12, I believe were engaging in sessions on a regular basis. And I know that when I looked at the period in the same time this year, I believe we were seeing an increase. So um, I think with any tool, there's a little bit of time to to uptake and get adjusted to it. Um, there was a lot going on last year with this. And so um, if I saw a decrease, I'd be a little bit worried, but if anything, I'm, I'm seeing an increase. So I think we're seeing more utilization. Um, to what degree exactly, I don't know. And I think we could follow up with you with more information if you want it. Yeah, I guess I'm just curious because, I mean, I'm just speaking from personal experience. My son was very off task last semester. And I, I, I guess I'm having trouble understanding are teachers supposed to be using that or is it to their own discretion where they're either using Go Guardian in their class? Because it seemed like there were certain classes where he's definitely off task more. And and then I know after I talked to my joint and kind of figured out the workaround students were using as far as like restarting the computer and yep. wiping clean the whitelist right before Christmas when I, you know, that problem had been fixed. Mm -hmm. My son played like three and a half or something like that hours of video games during class time in four days. And nobody, none of his teachers contacted me. I mean, there was one class, it was like 28 minutes that he was playing, another one 20, a bunch of 15 minute sections and I just don't understand if the teachers are utilizing that, how nobody would notice. He got blocked a couple of times, but it was sort of in the same class that he got blocked. So, and then he quit, you know, trying to do that. So I think it's great in theory, but if the teachers aren't using it or they don't know how to use it, then it's, you know, it's not effective. Yeah. So I think there's a couple different things. Some of it's legitimately just conversations between families and teachers are helpful and being able to say, hey, I'm seeing this concern with my parent report. As a parent, you're going to be able to see a, a finite number of kids, right? The kids that you have for like a middle school teacher, they're teaching hundreds of kids, so they're not going to see the same level of detail. So there are going to be times when they might not see that. And 
then there's the the class to class type of thing. So when we see the allow list and the blacklist for a class that is directing students towards a very specific resource. So let's say that I want students, one way we might be using technology efficiently is instead of if I wanted them to do a demonstration in science class, but you know I'm not gonna take the time to set up this whole lab to do a demonstration that they could also watch a two minute video for and see the same demonstration. The science teacher could set that up where it, that video is the only video that's allowed and it becomes very easy to control that. Um, when we went through um, some of the other ways we talk about digital citizenship is if we're having kids do research, we might open it up and say, we want, we want everything open to students for this learning task because they're doing research and we don't know you know what what websites they're going to go on to to do research research so depending on the learning task um the tools that jack just showed may be more helpful than in other cases um i just say that to say that like there are times when the learning task is go going to be more independent and then when we talk about our expectations for teachers too it's not necessarily all the time we're staring at this computer screen like it it's very efficient for jack to be able to sit up here and do all this monitoring because it's the only thing that he's doing well sure and that was the feedback i got from the teachers that i communicated that it's you know challenging to teach content and monitor mm -hmm. the guardian which i completely agree with that would be really yeah. oh yes that would be really challenging and right. you know yeah it's hard to do that but if they've whitelisted the websites that are allowable before the class, then I don't understand how my son was accessing video games when he should have been, you right. know, not had access to the class. So my question is, are teachers utilizing GoGuardian in their classes? Because it would seem that maybe they're not or not yeah. to the, you know, to the extent that maybe that they need to be in order to keep, you know, kind of the access to these other websites contained. Sure. Yeah. I don't think it's all one or the other, nor do I think that's what you're saying here, but I think teachers are learning how to use the tools better. So like um, Jack had alluded to on, on Monday, we had professional development. So we were at SIS and we kind of did the a GoGuardian reboot where we had gone through the tools at the beginning of the year, but with it being rel a relatively new tool, I think the teachers didn't really know what questions to ask at the beginning of the year. So it was just kind of orienting them to the tool. And so having gone halfway through the year, I think they've learned some things about how students are using it. Some of those are workarounds that Jack um, can help them with. So I think it's possible that they can use the tools more efficiently. Um, I think that's where like the communication between families and teachers is important is if you're noticing something, you're seeing what tools can be used in the classroom. Well, yes. And I think that's a, re you know, that's reasonable. And as a parent, I understand that I have a responsibility to monitor that. But when I've chatted with some other parents and I told them about my experience, I was so frustrated because this was right before Christmas you know after I'd been in communication with the teachers and the principal at SIS and and you all and um the parent said well and the she it's like it didn't compute that I was the one that found the issue that the it hadn't been reported to me by the teacher so I think the perception from families and the parents are that this stuff is being overseen by the school and the teachers that they're in the classroom with. I, you know, I just want to give you helpful feedback because I don't think that this is just our family's yeah. issue. And, you know, I want everyone to be successful in their learning at SIS and I also want the learning environment to be protected for all the students. Um, so I'm just telling you that 
parents were, you know, I've talked to a couple of friends about it and they said, well, the teacher didn't tell you that that happened. Like they, it's like, it didn't compute that I was the one that found the issue. Right. So I think a lot of parents assume that the school is maybe keeping a closer eye on those things. Yeah, did you want to add something? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Julia Radovicki and I have two kids in the Shorewood School District. I am also a teacher of 20 years and I teach over at Whitefish Bay High School. I'm a science teacher, bio and chem. So I live this life. And what I've noticed um, from some of the feedback that I've received from my son is that the Go Guardian isn't implemented consistently between classes. And at um, SAS, you have some veteran teachers, you have some new teachers and kind of everything in between. And the implementation of Go Guardian has just been inconsistent. And I think um, one of the reasons that Eden and I were attracted to Shorewood and this way, Fish Bay area uh, is that it was a traditional school district that, you know, I think at least Whitefish Fish Bay, <laughs> we caught a lot of flack because we weren't one-to-one -one when COVID hit because we were traditional. And then we launched into this one-to-one -one really quickly. And I just don't know that the level of um, training for the teachers has been um, adequate. I'm just, I can speak for myself. <laughs> yep. I know my training hasn't been adequate. Um, and just kind of trying to give you guys feedback from what we're seeing at home is that there needs to be just more uh, consistency. even, yeah, yeah, even consistency. And, um, it just seems, I was just really surprised, uh, at, with, you know, my son going to SAS and it just seems like every class period they're on the Chromebooks. And so if we're launching into this new tech, and we're spending a lot of time on technology, then that means that the staff needs to be able to manage that. Um, so I think that's... No, that's yeah. fair. And, and a reality, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a response to that. I just, I appreciate feedback. Yep. No, no, no. Julie, can you unmute yourself? Hello, uh, this is uh, Jeff Schauer. I'm Julie's husband. Uh, my son, John Henry, goes to SIS. And I, uh, you know, basically what I wanted to say was, I'm just echoing what the previous two uh, individuals said, so I don't really have a lot more to add. Maybe just that um, our experience at home has been it took us maybe three weeks uh, to wean my son off of his video game and various searching habits at school. Uh, we would go over his, um, his, you know, browsing history every night. And, and it seemed like there were some classes where the teachers maybe put forth an effort to use Go Guardian and limit what was being done and, and some didn't. So um, just, just echoing what was said before. And the last thing I'd like to say is it, it sounds like a lot of this design might be a little bit of a cat and mouse, um, kind of a setup. And I'm wondering if, <clears throat> you know, we might err on the side of whitelisting things rather than blacklisting them or, you know, relying on parents to, to, to go over this information with their kids every night, which, you know, I'm assuming that as one of the previous speakers said, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of parents think that the school is is doing a good job of monitoring um, when perhaps they might not be. So thank you. And I, and this is actually Julie. And I just wanted to say kind of to piggyback off of something that Julia, I think it was Julia said um, in person, which is that the a lot of the instruction at SIS seems to be focused on the Chromebook. And I think that, you know, there's some advantages to that, of course. 
And yet I wonder if more of the instruction were shifted away from the Chromebook, if it would improve some of the problems that we're seeing and maybe other people are seeing as well. And what, you know, just from a scientific brain science point of view, it's just not ideal for developing brains to be in front of a device, a screen, so much of their day. And especially interactive screens have a different impact. So even like, you know, when we were, our son was small, we were concerned maybe more about TV time and, and you know, the impact of that. But viewing TV has less of a problematic impact on brain development than more interactive engagement online. And so we're, we're really not sure, I think, as a society, and certainly we don't know in Shorewood, and maybe you guys do, but I, I doubt it, um, because I think in society, we don't quite know what it means to have children in this developmental stage sitting in front of devices so much of their day. And I guess I just wonder about, um, you know, if there's a way to move toward a greater percentage of their time being spent off the devices in the classroom, um, you know, more of the traditional learning that was referenced by Julia. Thank you for hearing my comment. I still have a comment too, I'd like to make. Okay. My name is Tracy Clark and I have two children in the district uh, at Lake Bluff in second grade and also at seventh grade at SIS. Um, I have, um, I am a teacher as well and I am a big proponent of the appropriate use of technology in the educational classroom. I think it's a 21st century um, skill set that we absolutely need to embed um, with our children. And having said that, I think that there is a curriculum of digital citizenship that needs to be partnered with that, that is av readily available, but has not been yet adapted by this district or have, I heard it mentioned in passing, but not in a scaffolded form that's appropriate to grade levels. And that can be carried out all the way through from K-4, as soon as they are on the tablet, to 12th grade. That I think is our responsibility as a community and as a district. And I don't, I'm deeply concerned with um, what I'm seeing now in the middle school because of that lack of that curriculum um, and we know that that was exacerbated by COVID, but we also know that we're several years past COVID now. And with that exacerbation for my middle schooler, I'm seeing a gap in the skill set just from basic ac you know, access, being able to use it, but having complete reliance on it, but being able to navigate, understanding some basic keyboarding issues. Um, things have been skipped in their curriculum. And so this also results in um, a gap that we're seeing and them being able to not just navigate the technology, but the whole world that they're being thrown into when there's these type of gaps in the monitoring of their usage in the classroom between parents and teachers and the district. And this is a lot to put onto teachers. And so that's why there needs to be a structure of support am amongst the district that's consistent so that one teacher is not does not have one classroom policy and another teacher has another one. And that impacts um, the flow uh, of for the children as they're going from classroom to classroom. They need that consistency. I'm also concerned about the use of cell phones. And I don't know what that is as we go through the high school, we are gonna add another level uh, to the, the, the technology. I don't know what that consistency is. I believe that, sh that should be uh, aligned throughout the district. Um, regardless of what building the children are in, they should have that kind of set path for them. We are putting too much on their plates. And without that, that structure of support in place from the district, we're putting too much on the plates of teachers. And then we're putting too much on the plates of parents as well. And we're all trying to help the kids and we're not aligned in, in partnership with that. And I think that the district needs to step into that gap and create that structure of support and to collate, create that collaborative environment so that we have that, that environment for our kids to support them in a true 21st century um, skill set that they absolutely need and that will enhance their learning moving forward. Um, but I think that the other part of this too that I haven't heard yet is the impact that we have uh, as far as social ramifications, mental health ramifications, and how that progresses and the um, influx with um, social skills um, and um, how that is also being 
influenced by this, especially if kids are allowed to play video games at recess um, or as a form of their break or their downtime. Um, we need to really be um, defining what the academic environment is for this district and helping um, our, our, our students and our kids navigate through that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, can I just add what I'll right after that, just to address one piece that you mentioned is, um, so Elizabeth Russell is our district librarian. Um, she started with us last year um, and Jack and she and I are looking to update our technology and library plan, which is where the digital citizenship skills would lie. So I would anticipate as we get into next year, as we update that plan, that we can be more deliberate with what those digital citizenship lessons look like. So just wanted to address that piece of it. I should use this. Hi, Amber Wachowski. Um, I have two kids at Atwater in fifth grade and second grade. I am also an educator. Um, I'm a uh, professor at Marquette University where I teach classes in writing and argumentation. I teach classes in data, like science, data analytics, in the case of you know public policy analysis. And so I'm not a Luddite, um, I'm not. But what I'm about to say is this district has kind of marched, I, I kind of feel like blindly, in some sense, it makes sense. It was COVID. We needed to find a way to meet a need. And we put these in the hands of very young students. I don't think we're supporting our teachers in terms of the, the curriculum. Um, I'm hearing things where you all are talking about SIS. And I'm here to say, I'm seeing this at fifth grade. Those fifth graders are on these devices all day. They bring them home, they're on them all day. Um, so I guess um, I wanna make, I guess two comments, three comments, and then I wanna speak to four concerns. So three comments, one, I think I now have a much better understanding about why my students in the college classroom are struggling so much. I think I've gotten a better sense of their K-12 experience and how that's setting them up for not great success in the college classroom. We don't have GoGuardian. I don't get to like click on the, the screen and you know say focus or pay attention to this you know tab or to remove it. Uh, second comment, I would encourage folks in the district to, to think about the maybe the, the science behind this. I think this was this came up in some of the, the comments. Um, a book that I would recommend to all of us is Marianne Wolf's Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in, um, in a Digital World. It's wonderful. You can listen to interviews with her as well. Please read it. Um, and then the third comment I'll just make is to echo. Um, I think that focus on GoGuardian the teacher use of it or, or the lack of consistency, I don't think that's the right question. I think there's a first order question, which is really about the, the broader sort of use of technology and how it's connected to our educational mission and educational goals. So four concerns, I'm gonna give like really specific examples um, for each of these. My first concern, the use of technology um, inhibiting, um, impeding the development of strong reading comprehension skills across grades. I'll give the example. We know that the reading brain processes information differently when we have infinite scroll. Even in the case of an ebook reader, that will still impact reading comprehension because our minds kind of categorize and spatially make sense of uh, reading material. Think about it. You're reading a book and you kind of remember, oh, wait a minute. I have a kind of sense of where in the book physically that point is. When students are learning content and learning to read, if it is done strictly even on an e-reader or in cases where there's infinite scroll, it has huge impact on reading comprehension across grades. So that's the first concern, an example. Second would be the, the broader question of just writing instruction, communication, expression, critical thinking. Writing is thinking, full stop. Writing is thinking. Um, you gave the example of research and what this would look like. You know, well, the why, you know, the World Wide Web, put a bunch of tabs on, search, you know, what's out there. As someone who teaches research and writing, I said, oh my gosh, that's just the wrong way to teach those really fundamental skills about research. Um, and so I think that the example there for um, 
to, to really think about the ways in which technology can be used smartly, but the ways in which it may be undermining our, our um, instruction. Third concern, attention and focus. Um, I'm gonna give the example here about gamification. And I'm gonna make the argument that this gamification, what I mean here, it's a lot I see with my fifth grader, she uses like these gim kits. They're like little games that she can do to kind of practice and kind of quiz herself on a concept. Um, it's addictive engagement. She kind of wants to keep going, keep going. We, we literally have to pry this out of her little fingertips. Um, just one more. And she will say, it's because of school. I'm, I'm doing homework, mom. Um, it's addictive. Um, and it is addictive engagement. It is thin engagement. It is not deep engagement. It is not developing her curiosity. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about the attention, the focus, playing games with class. I mean, the, the stories that she's sharing, the ways in which those students are getting around all the sorts of guardrails, it's it's really easy um, for the ways in which they're, they're getting around it. Fourth concern would be the mental health um, issue. And here's a, a simple example. I was shocked when I heard my daughter say at the dinner table, when we're like, honey, done with the homework, you know, device down. No, mom, I got to see how many people like it. And I said, I, I don't understand. What are, you, what are you talking about? And it was one of these apps that was encouraged that had like a like feature, exactly the sort of social engagement tools that we know the social media companies used to drive that sort of addictive makes you want to like want more and more and more. I'm concerned because she's at a period in her sort of developmental course where peer environment, peer pressure, can, you know, that is, she's in it, right? She's at that, that stage. So concerns, reading comprehension, the sort of critical thinking skills, reasoning skills, communication skills, attention, focus would be the third concern, um, and our concern over, over mental health. I would ask the district, um, let's let's take a step back. I think it's too much. Um, I would maybe, I, I'm less concerned about the high school, perhaps, than I am actually about the younger grades and SIS, and actually for different reasons. Um, again, I would encourage folks to read Marianne Wolf. I think she gives really good arguments for why, yes, we need students to know technology and engage it and learn it, but we also have to make sure that their brains are developed in, 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 in kind of, I don't wanna say like the traditional sort of way, but it, eventually it'll be, it'll be both, but we can't lose sight of some of the very fundamental skills. And I think I'm not an SIS parent, I soon will be, and I'm terrified, honestly, of kind of the social, you know, emotional health and mental health. Um, I'm, I'm concerned by what I see in my, among my college students. Um, I'm, I'm struck by how stuck they are um, in terms of, kind of just where they are emotionally. It feels like they are really what I would presume to be maybe a first year high school student and they're a first year college student. And I do think they're connected to their, their K-12 environment. That's very long winded. I'm sorry, I'm thrilled that the district is, is having this. Um, I, we need more conversations like this, thanks. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, and I would just, to respond to, to some of this that might be a glimmer of hope in all of this is um, when we talk about curriculum and instruction, I do think about when we look at materials. So we're looking at um, KA English language arts materials. And so part of what we were also doing on Monday is getting feedback from teachers. And <laughs> I'd written this down before you had uh, said it, but Discussion, debate, and writing were three things that the teachers were talking about making sure that we could see in the curriculum. Um, because yeah, those are great opportunities to be able to, uh, to engage without having to have a screen in front of you. So thank you. I don't have my, I don't have my screen in front of me. What time? <laughs> Okay, so second day, it was that February 19th? Okay, so February 19th, uh, we wanted to gather some feedback on what would be a good next step for this conversation. 
Um, so there is a, before I get to the QR code, I mean, I got to get through all the slides. Um, so just letting people know that there's some resources here on uh, kind of the types of types of apps that kids would be engaging with at grade levels. And then on this screen, each of these have a link to articles or resources if you wanted to dive deeper into some of um, these topics. So I would encourage people to click on those. And then finally, on the last slide is the QR code, which will take you to a link to the Google form, which again, your feedback will help inform what um, our next presentation has in it. So thanks for the feedback. Um, and again, going back to like, we only got stronger through this partnership. So keep the dialogue going. Holding me, 